Uh, very well. Uh, it seems to be a minute past nine, so I think we can get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michal Hermanovic. I work at the Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling, University of Warsaw, Poland. Uh, it is my pr pleasure to um, welcome you to the workshop on neural networks, the SOL project, as well as the Frovedis framework. Before we dive into the topic, uh, let me very briefly address the agenda for today. Um, we will have two speakers, uh, Dr. Nicholas Weber from NEC Laboratories Europe and Dr. Eric Vogt from NEC HPC Europe. Uh, the workshop itself uh, is divided into parts. We will start with the lecture uh, and uh, then move on to the practical uh, hands-on session so that uh, you'll have a chance to test the NECSX Aurora Tsubasa system uh, installed at ICM. Uh, now, uh, just a very short announcement uh, concerning the practical session. Uh, each participant should have received an email yesterday uh, with a username and password that are necessary to participate in the hands-on session. If uh, for some reason you have not, uh, please send me an email to the address that uh, you can see in the chat window uh, as soon as possible, preferably, so that uh, we have some time to fix it before the hands-on session starts. Uh, in the chat window, you can also see a link to a short instruction on how to log into the ICM infrastructure and access the uh, NEC vector engine. So uh, you might want to have a look at that as well. And uh, I think that would be all on my part. So uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. And uh, this screen is now yours, Nicholas. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Nicholas from NEC Labs Europe, and I will give uh, the presentation on the first part on the SOL project, which is about neural networks on the SX Aurora. And later on, Eric Fort will tell about uh, the Frovedis framework. Um, okay, let's start. So the problem with neural network is if you want to do it, um, you need to choose one of the frameworks. And this is only a small overview. I'm pretty sure that there are much more frameworks out there. Um, however, most prominently are probably uh, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch. However, as a hardware vendor, you actually have the same problem because you somehow want to support actually all of these frameworks. Um, but it comes with a couple of problems. So first of all, each framework has its own internal and external APIs, and there's no common code base. So which means that for each of these frameworks, you actually need to reinvent the wheel again, 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 which is a lot of effort. There are some approaches uh, like MLIR, ONNX, and DLPack, um, which uh, try to have some, at least some commonalities between the different frameworks. Um, the problem is that they are usually not widely adopted. And that's all, one reason is that these big frameworks uh, um, are supported by um, different vendors uh, like Google or Facebook. And um, well, they don't like each other. So you can look, look this up actually in, in the discussion board. So MLIR was invented by TensorFlow uh, for TensorFlow flow by Google and there was this post from a guy asking if they um, added to the Glow compiler which is part of PyTorch and the answer is literally no we're not considering it. Uh, a couple of months later you have this post on um, GitHub uh, where somebody is asking to directly integrate it into PyTorch and the guy from Facebook answers maybe if it's getting a little bit more stable. So as you can see here um, there's actually not, not an interest from the people to uh, work on on like common code bases for different frameworks. Um, another problem is actually upstreaming your device support to the framework. So this is a screenshot from the efforts from AMD. So they started in September 2017 to upstream their support. And if you go to the PyTorch homepage, still today, you cannot download a package which has AMD support in it. You even need to compile it your, your own or you need to download it from some AMD homepage. Well, I, I think that um, tells already a couple of things. Um, I actually made it the experience myself. So I found a bug in PyTorch and submitted a free line bug fix and it took over two months until it was in the final release. So um, I don't want to imagine how long it will take to uh, submit like device support with thousands of lines of code. It could take years probably. Um, so we thought, okay, how, how can we do this better? And um, I was already working on Sol, which is a middleware for AI, AI acceleration, which means 
Soul doesn't have a front-end interface. So it's not a new framework. It actually integrates into existing frameworks and adds additional functionality. And um, we thought we already have this framework available. So uh, it might be only a small step to add also additional device support through Soul into the framework. And we actually um, succeeded doing that. Um, before I um, explain a little bit more on how we did this, um, I want to explain where Soul is originally coming from. So when I started the project, I was looking into the description of a neural network, which looks a little bit like this. So you have different layers, which can have parameters and um, some data flow in it, actually. And uh, if you take a look a little bit on the details, how it is implemented. So my first reaction was re literally Captain Picard in this place because each of them is a single function call with a lot of nested loops. And the worst, actually what can happen is like something like the ReLU layer, which uh, can process hundreds of megabytes of data. And the only thing it's doing is like loading 100 megabytes of data, applying the maximum between zero and the input data and writing everything back to the memory. So it's literally just moving memory from A to B all the time. And um, so what you actually want to have is uh, something that looks a little bit more like traditional uh, computing um, programming where you have a few uh, um, loops where the, the real loop, for instance, is directly put into this uh, computation here. Actually, here's a mistake on the, on the slide. This should be X, um, Never mind. Um, yeah, so you want to have something uh, a little bit more, more compact and more focused on performance rather than on this functional programming that we had before. However, this is actually what uh, the people doing ML want to do. So that's the reason why I started Sol in, in the beginning, um, to assist people to write their code in style and still get the performance of this style. Um, the problem is lies in the details. So if you do this in a uh, device um, code, um, you have much more details like data types. Uh, you need to take care of uh, cores, of vector loops, of inner loops. Um, sometimes you need to reduction depending on your computations. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than it looks from the outside. However, as a user, you don't need to care about it. The user interface looks as follows. So this is a small example from PyTorch where we load uh, some packages, we initialize a predefined model, uh, some input data, and then we just run the model with the input data and get some result. Um, with Sol, it's only these three changes more. So we uh, import a Sol package. We um, translate the PyTorch model into a Sol model using the Sol optimize function. And then we can use the Sol model um, the same way that we can use uh, the Pi model. Actually, the Soul model in principle is actually a PyTorch model. Um, so we uh, use the, the ability of the frameworks to add custom layers or custom models, and um, which uh, allows us to um, actually keep all of the parameters uh, inside the framework memory space, which allows us to use all of the nice learning functionalities of the framework. And we only offload the execution into Sol. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you have any, um, questions at any point in time, please just use the chat and I will try to answer them as soon as possible. Okay, now let's go on to how fast everything is. I mean, Sol is about uh, ex uh, acceleration of neural networks and everybody wants to see how good the SX Aurora compares against other devices. Um, I have here a chart with uh, three devices, a uh, Xeon server, uh, a Titan V, which is uh, from the Volta architecture. Um, it has a comparable uh, um, performance to the V100, but it's much cheaper. So that's why we have a Titan V and not a V100 and uh, the SX Aurora. Um, I tried this with a couple of uh, CNNs, as you can see here, and the multi-layer perceptron. And uh, I have to admit that Axion is really the slowest device in the entire test. Um, especially if you take a look at uh, the GPU results. This is also the, the reason why everybody's actually telling you to buy GPUs um, to do uh, AI, because they're much, much faster than CPUs. Now, the SX Aurora is faster than CPUs, but slower than GPUs. So as expected, it's somewhere in between. 
Um, I mean, if you take a look at the performance numbers, uh, the Titan V has uh, three and a half times more fl uh, floating point uh, operations than the SX Aurora. And this is usually also the gap that you can see between uh, different devices. And um, the thing is, training is really um, of new network is really a compute intensive operation where the higher memory bandwidth of the SX Aurora doesn't play into. So um, it, it doesn't help the Aurora to, to catch up here. However, this is only one step of the entire execution. I mean, training is uh, what you do to um, tell your model, okay, these are 1,000 cat pictures, um, learn how, to, how a cat looks like. And the next step actually is inference, um, where you use your model to identify the cat. This is also um, what you would actually have in your final application. For instance, if you do weather forecasting and you use AI to do some of the um, forecasting in your um, model, um, the part would be uh, the inference. And this looks a little bit different. Okay, not really for the Xeon, it's still the slowest. And, um, but if you take a look on the Titan V, it actually, the difference between the Xeon and the Titan V is getting smaller. So remember before the Titan V was somewhere here, so at least twice as fast as here in this case. Um, and if we add the SX Aurora with Sol, we see that it's now actually competing. In this case, it's even faster than the GPU. And um, because the reason is, if you take a look back on the on, on the um, um, hardware specifications up here, um, the GPU cannot leverage all of its compute power because inference is much more memory bound than uh, training. Because um, for instance, the easiest um, example is the uh, linear layer or dense layer, because that's a matrix matrix multiplication in training. In uh, inference, it's just a matrix vector multiplication. So it's actually the worst case. You need to load the entire matrix once and only use every result, uh, every value of it only once. While matrix, multi matrix multiplication, you use it uh, multiple times. Okay. As I said, uh, inference is actually the step that you want to integrate into your application. And uh, you usually don't want, if you have existing code, maybe written in Fortran or something, you don't want uh, to call a Python library or a Python framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow uh, through, um, uh, through your Fortran code. Uh, further, you also don't need all of the functionality. So you would actually load a, um, a very big framework and system with functionality that you don't need to use during inference. So there are a dozen of available tools for doing the inference part, like TensorFlow Lite, LibTorch, Onix Runtime, and so on, and so on, and so on. Some of them are, are only for specific vendors. So OpenVINO, I think, is only for Intel hardware. TensorRT is only for NVIDIA hardware. And um, I probably also missed like 20 other tools on this list because uh, doing like a deployment into your own software is really where a lot of people have worked on. Um, however, you also can do this with Sol with ease. So uh, remember, we had the Sol optimize function call before. Now we also have like a Sol deploy where you put in your trained model. Um, you define a, a target like a shared library or static library. Um, we're also working on a Python integration that you can directly call it from Python. And um, the device that you want to have, in this case, it's the uh, vector engine like the SX Aurora. Uh, you can define a library name if you want to and a function call. And what you get is uh, a static or shared C++ library um, with uh, interface where you can just put in your input data here and you get the output data there. Um, there are some more advanced features where you can also provide like a user context if you want to integrate your own memory allocator or something, but I will not explain this uh, today. Um, yeah. In principle, that's you would train your uh, model in PyTorch, and then you say this sole deploy, and then you can directly integrate it into your existing application. Um, okay, I'm nearly at the end of my talk for the so presentation, and I want to give a, a short outlook on the, on the roadmap. So currently we have support for PyTorch ONA Next, um, for CNN, MLP, and Transformer networks, for the training, inference, and deployment executions, some more stuff that I will skip here. Um, for the tested neural networks, actually we have tested a, a whole bunch here. Um, for the transformers, this is actually the newest kind of networks that we're supporting.
spotting. Uh, there was still a bug in the version, unfortunately, that we will be using today, um, but it will be fixed in the upcoming release. So it, I hope you don't want to run a GPT-2 uh, uh, transformer today because that will unfortunately not work. Also, LSTM and crew will uh, be added at the end of the year, probably. Um, as I said, roadmap um, for October, we are planning to release support for uh, the deal for J framework, which is a something that like PyTorch just in written in Java. Um, in December, we want to ha finally have the upgrade to TensorFlow version two and uh, the LSTM networks. And unfortunately, we figured out that there's a problem with the data parallelism in PyTorch because there's really a check implemented in PyTorch, which checks if device is CUDA, then do data parallel, else just do it serial. And um, so we, we are unfortunately excluded from this feature. So we are looking into how to um, implement it or actually, actually uh, upstream support into PyTorch so that we can uh, leverage this. Um, for next year, actually, we want to do a little bit more high level stuff like uh, adjustable memory consumption during training so that you can say, um, I don't care that my calculations maybe take a half day longer, but I want to save more memory because I want to run bigger batch sizes. Um, this is a feature that we want to add uh, custom layers so that you actually can write your own C++ code and integrate it into a Sol network. Um, some algorithmic and total code optimizations to improve the performance. And we are also considering to um, add uh, NumPy uh, support Board. NumPy is not a neural network um, framework, but actually the operations are pretty similar to what usually these AI frameworks can do. So uh, it's um, not a big effort for us to add the support. And this is the point where I would like to hand over to my colleague Eric Focht from NEC Germany, who uh, wants to talk about the Fervatus framework. Are there any more questions left so that I can answer them before, or shall we just? Go on with Eric Vogt. Seems nobody's typing. Then, yeah, then. Oops. So you were very quick. Why did you rush this way? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I still have a presentation later on for the hands-on session, but it has details about Soul that I want to show later okay. on. So. Okay, now let me see how this works uh, with me sharing the presentation. I actually did this before. But always had a problem with choosing a proper screen. So let's see if I if I manage to do it this this time. Um, okay. So. Um, not good. Okay, you tell me what you see, please. Uh, I'm I'm not so sure. If currently I don't it, see anything. Uh, just a second. Yeah, we cannot see anything. So uh, just just a second. Um, to share your screen, you can just click uh, the share screen icon next to the microphone where you're uh, enabling your microphone there's the screen sharing uh, button let me try this one so yep. now we, we can, can see it. you see that now if i if i turn this on what do you see now the same uh, do you see the control screen of the presentation or do you see the presentation no, we, no, we, we just see, see the, uh, the, the window with the... Oh, I see. So okay, no, so, no full screen. so... I think you need to start a presentation and then select... Um, yeah, if I get you want to show. Um, so, you should okay. probably... Okay. Dis disable. 
I, I try like this. Um, the, now you see the presentation. I started the presentation in a window because um, I'm otherwise kind of yes. Is this okay? You 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 see the the window. You you see some some junk here on the yes bottom, yes uh, yes. But it but it's fine. Okay. Um, fine. So. Uh, what I want to talk about is, um, uh, let's say, a, another side of machine learning uh, on SX Aurora Tsubasa uh, that is on um, accelerating Spark machine learning library and data frame with vector processors. Uh, the presentation has actually been, um, or the core of the presentation comes from Takeo Hosomi and Takuya Araki from the data science laboratories at NAC Corporation. They are, uh, Takuya Araki is actually the author of Frovedis. The, um, and uh, they pre presented this at the um, Spark Summit last year. Now, um, I kind of refreshed it in some details and um, um, that's what it is about. So, so summary, um, this is an introduction to a uh, very short introduction to the vector processor SX Aura Tsubasa. It has different characteristics uh, from a GPGPU. You will hear and you heard this before from Nicolas as well. Um, it has well, it used to have larger memory and higher memory bandwidth, uh, still kind of there, um, but uh, GPUs also ventured into the uh, realm of uh, five to six HPMs, so they're catching up there. Um, vector processors evolved from HPC. They are optimized for, um, let's say, they say unified big data analysis. They're actually optimized for uh, streaming and for simple handling of of data, including data of movement, which is kind of a poorer characteristic on GPUs. Um, and they are especially suitable for statistical machine learning. So um, um, right now they are uh, we we are distributing. Um, or we're selling the vector engine in, in systems and they can be packaged with machine learning middleware um, in C++ um, and MPI. Uh, this uh, from various middleware that I'm speaking about adapts uh, Apache Spark APIs and is uh, up to 100 times faster than Spark on x86. Um, what is a vector processor? Well, a scalar processor that, that is uh, not quite right here, but the principle is right. A scalar processor has computational units and is um, its, its connection to the memory is rather weak. Uh, the typical bandwidth to memory is in the range of 100 something uh, gigabytes per second. Um, and the way to process data is um, taking data from a register, putting it uh, in, in, in a compute unit that can be a SIMD unit or not, and um, then delivering it back. The, the point is that uh, one instruction issue is triggering one such operation, one instruction issue at some point or, or is able to deliver one result or maybe n results for the SIMD case, which with n in the range of maybe eight or something like that. The processor uh, in, the, um, in the classical uh, way is um, uh, triggering a lot more operations. So our vector register width is 256 double precision elements or 512 single precision elements. And um, the time to process a vector vector register is in the range of eight cycles instead of just one cycle. So we are filling up the pipeline for, for processing. Uh, uh, we are using the pipeline for longer time. Uh, now, in order to be able to use this, the processor needs to be uh, uh, well 
suited for transferring data, for streaming data in a, in a very good way. And that's something we benefit of. So we have a very large memory bandwidth. Our uh, current in incarnation on top model um, has 1.53 terabytes per second. Uh, but uh, we are not uh, so strictly following the peak performance challenge here, which means that on peak performance, we strive for a more balanced processor. What we came up with is uh, this. So uh, on the left side, you see what we used to have before. That is the um, last uh, mainframe style uh, supercomputer from NEC called SX Ace. And our um, computers right now look like these. They are uh, implemented as PCI vector cards. And you might have seen that before. So we have uh, a range of products from uh, tower PC up to uh, liquid cooled uh, supercomputers. Um, basically servers up to here, which need to be integrated into, into racks or can be, can be used uh, in various granularities. Um, these are the SKUs that we have on the left lower side. Um, the processor installed at ICM Warsaw is the 10B. Um, that is a 48 gigabyte memory capacity, 1.22 terabyte per second um, v vector engine. It is the first generation of the vector engine. Meanwhile, we had the 2019 generation, which is the uh, 10 CE, BE, and AE. And uh, this year, we just uh, uh, released the 20B and 20A. Um, these are going up to 10 cores and um, uh, have 1.53 terabyte per second memory bandwidth. Um, performance um, uh, in, in machine learning, um, often we use uh, single precision because it's it's uh, it, it doesn't so the details or the, the rounding errors are not so important in statistical methods. Uh, they, we can overcome rounding problems. Uh, therefore, uh, what counts is this single precision performance. Um, as you see here, we are not close to uh, to uh, Nvidia performance in uh, single precision operations. They are. Uh, range three apart if you disregard the tensor units. Now, um, that's um, another slide with processor specifics, but the slide is coming actually from the first generation. Um, the core message here is on the processor, we have six HBM2s. This is high bandwidth memory, 3D stacks. Um, then we have on every core, not on every core, I'm sorry, on the processor, we have a shared controllable cache. This is a vector cache uh, uh, with 16 uh, megabyte size. Uh, vector cache needs to be very, very fast. Uh, um, and it, the vector cache is actually uh, the entity which controls cache coherency in this processor. A uh, connection from a core to a cache has the bandwidth of 400 uh, gigabytes per second, uh, which is actually 400 in each direction. So it's, you can call it 800 if you want. Um, and um, that's it more or less for the processor. The way to use this is let's say twofold. The main um, idea was to use the vector engine as a native processor, like native processor. And um, um, uh, while, while this is um, a different approach from the GPU, uh, GPU has the 
loading model uh, where basically the main program is running on AKT6 on your host and you offload certain kernels and uh, execute those kernels on the vector engine. Well, on the vector engine, you can do it differently. You can run the application on the vector engine and you can actually uh, offload system call execution to the uh, host or you can offload execution of other functions, other uh, uh, routines to the vector host. Uh, now uh, for AI and ML, this, um, this is not quite right. So let's put it this way. What Nicolas Weber is uh, explaining on Sol is uh, using the left type of offloading model. And, and Frovedis is actually using the right type of offloading model but in a very uh, twisted way and you will see it immediately um, usability this is the way how you actually are supposed to use the computer you might know this you have uh, normal programs you edit them you compile them like here with ncc ncc is our our nc cross compiler for the aurora and uh, you then execute them uh, here, um, for the sake of explicitness, you see the interpreter of this. This is not an interpreter, it's actually a loader. This is loading the program into the vector engine and watching it and monitoring its, its exceptions. But actually you can just call dot slash, uh, dot slash a dot out to run a program. The interpreter is uh, implicit, so to say. Um, note, Worthy here is we have uh, standard programming languages, uh, C, C++, Fortran, MPI. We use MPI for parallelization and OpenMP. Um, and now we have an LLVM VE effort to bring an open source compiler onto the uh, machine. Um, this one in order to be able to use intrinsics in a very direct way, so vector intrinsics. Then we started integrating the region vectorizer, which is an auto loop vectorizer, very modern vectorizer into LLVMV. And in the latest uh, release, we integrated OMP target um, uh, offloading to the host from the vector engine and, and reverse uh, and the other way around from the host to the vector engine, so both directions. That is experimental, it's very fresh, but uh, we're happy that this is now starting to go mainline also for us. Um, so why vector engine? Um, it can accelerate memory intensive workloads. Uh, high memory bandwidth and large memory capacity are what you need for, for data analytics. Um, and uh, we can implement uh, all the functions with standard programming, which makes this pretty fast. Um, we can also scale multiple vector processors. Um, we do have direct data transfer among multiple vector processors through PCIe and through Infinita. So, uh, looking at AI, a picture of AI machine from our Tsubasa. Our Tsubasa has high memory performance. We are at this end, but not the top compute performance. Um, therefore, we consider it is very well suited for stati statistical and machine learning um, uh, data frame like operations. This is why I mentioned Frovedis. And um, in where uh, the demand, well, the, the balance switches from memory bandwidth or memory bound to compute bound. There you see, uh, you will see Sol uh, um, providing vector engine support. And we also have a native uh, TensorFlow implementation. Uh, but uh, basically Sol covers all this even so covers uh, the functionality that uh, our native TensorFlow is also providing. Um, Provedis. Provedis um, is a pretty long acronym. Um, we 
shied away from integrating this directly into Spark. Uh, Spark was a long time kind of uh, beta, not well, not really beta, but um, when we started with this project, it was in the times of SXAs, and then Spark just just showed up while we had a framework for doing this kind of analytics, and we we morphed our API to resemble Spark. And um, now we have a C++ framework similar to Spark. Spark is uh, using the Java virtual machine uh, for computation. Um, it supports uh, the Python interface of Spark as well. And in the back end, um, Fravedis is using MPI. MPI is used for high performance communication in the back end for connecting these Fravedis servers to each other. Um, it is open source. You find it on GitHub. You will see some references later. Um, so um, there is a Fravedis core. On top of the core, you have a matrix library. You have machine learning library and data frame this is these are the cores of our vector engine support and on top you have the spark python interface um, we provide uh, spark core like functionalities like map reduce uh, internally we use mpi for doing that um, we the, the mpi of course inherently supports multiple cards and multiple servers so we can scale um, our uh, map reduce uh, like Spark to, to large numbers with vector engines, to large numbers of nodes, to large memories, aggregated memory sizes. Uh, user, users don't need to be aware of MPI to write distributing processes, processing code with Fravedis. Uh, you just write functions in, in C++ um, and we provide the functions to the framework um, uh, to run them in parallel. So this is an example where um, a distributed variable just does things uh, in parallel, transparently. Now, a uh, kind of more complete sample program is here. It's a program in the, which, which shows how you integrate this in C++. You, you include Fravedis.hpp. Uh, um, so um, then um, you use Fravedis namespace. And basically, that is the core thing. Use Fravedis, use passing arguments uh, over to this. This will initialize Fravedis uh, in the back end. That means this will start an MPI program in the backend with the parameters, with the arguments that you are passing. So number of nodes and so on. So you can integrate this into the batch system. And then uh, you are using this in your normal way while the API is doing under the hood the data distribution uh, uh, over the over the uh, Fravedi servers and uh, parallel processing. OK. Um, the destructor at the end is actually calling MPI finalize. And um, there is an order of the ranks. Rank zero is actually sending our RPCs uh, to ranks one to end to do the work. Yeah. So now matrix library. Uh, matrix library is one of the components is implemented using Fravedis core and existing libraries uh, from our uh, XE library collection. Uh, those, would, those are ScalarPack, uh, uh, LaPack, BLAS, and Parallel RPack. Um, it uh, supports dense and sparse matrix of uh, various formats. You see them here. So you see uh, compressed row, uh, compressed column, uh, ELL, um, jagged diagonal, and so on. So um, this provides basic uh, matrix operations and linear algebra, uh, in 
including solves, uh, transpose, uh, matrix multiply, sparse matrix vector multiply, and so on. And, and uh, this is uh, well documented uh, basically in the manual. I point you to the manual later. And you, you, you can use this in, in, if, in your data analytics. Uh, then there is the core or thing that makes it interesting in this talk, um, machine learning library. Um, they are implemented with Frovedis core and the matrix library. They support both dense and sparse data. Sparse data support is, um, let's say, seems to get more and more important in large scale machine learning. Um, and here is a big collection of algorithms that are supported. And uh, the, the group is uh, uh, developing more and more of these algorithms. So you um, basically last year we had only the first two columns and this year the, the third column came came to them uh, joined them um, date frame is the other component data frame supports a similar interface as spark data frame and operations like select filter sort join a group by and aggregate group by aggregate. Um, so um, SQL interface is not supported yet. Uh, it is implemented as a distributed column store where the vectors are, um, each column is represented as a distributed vector. So if you see column A, column A is distributed among the ranks and uh, each operation only scans argument columns only scans argument columns, uh, or scans the columns it needs. Other columns are created when necessary. So this is basically the, the data is materialized when it is really needed in order to, of course, also to save memory. This is like an in-memory uh, data processing. Uh, an important thing uh, is that we support the Python interface. Spark uh, Python interface as well as a scikit learn like Python interface. Um, where so instead of writing C++ programs, um, um, there is a wrapper um, um, emulating Spark API for the implemented functions. Um, and uh, actually this wrapper uh, implements what you've seen before in C++. You have hidden the creation of the server and the functionality. There is RPC uh, passing over the commands um, to the MPI process in the background. But actually in the, um, in the front end, you are running your native Python on your uh, host, on your whatever host that is. It, it could be just a host connected to the, the vector engine machines. Um, that is so your interactive operation uh, in rank zero of the Frovedis server waits for RPCs. Um, um, well, not, well, rank zero of the Frovedis server is waiting for RPCs from the Spark driver. Uh, they the communication then is done in parallel, so data is pulled from the Spark workers. And basically, this is why you can pretty well intertwine Spark with uh, Frovedis uh, stuff. So if, if you, Frovedis doesn't happen to support some of the Spark functionality, then you will be able to run it as on the Spark servers. Uh, programming interface uh, in Spark language is this. Uh, on the top, you see the original Spark um, API where you import from here uh, logistic regression with SGD. And then, uh, yeah, you call train on that. All that you do is you change the import, you redirect this from R. Spark to come any C providers, but the rest of the path stays the same. And then you will need 
need to start and stop the server. So in Python, we will need to do this explicitly. Um, and basically, this um, Frobedi server initialize must contain the details on how you actually start the server. So details on how you call MPI run. That is the only place where you actually touch MPI in this. Uh, so here again, you see, this is also a hybrid program, but Frovedis actually works like a native program because it is a native MPI program with an RPC style interface waiting for commands on, uh, on uh, the vector engines. Um, there is a, another uh, implementation of the API or another flavor um, that is the scikit-learn uh, flavor. Um, you see again uh, what you have to replace and it is absolutely the same procedure like with Spark or the import path is a little different. And uh, the main thing is that this API for, for is the same as scikit-learns API. Uh, there is yarn support. This will not, you won't care about this. Uh, the thing is uh, the way how you start actually your backend for this doesn't matter. You can start it manually with just an MPI run. You can start it by submitting a batch job or you can start it uh, with yarn if you have something like that. Uh, performance evaluation, um, that's an old slide, let's say st state of vector engine one, one, well, 10B, that is actually what you also have uh, in Warsaw. So that's machine learning evaluation um, for logistic regression, uh, what you see here is a result normalized to the Spark x86-64 result, which is one. Then you have logistic regression with Frovedis running on x86-64, but Frovedis instead of Spark. That brings you a factor of 10 here. Uh, that's the difference from, from Java virtual machine to properly written C++. And you get another factor of 10 uh, when you switch to the vector engine. This is one vector engine compared to one socket of the um, old Skylake. Skylake got. K means uh, goes up to factor 40 here, and the uh, value this decomposition is a factor 56 here. Now, that was the old version of Spark 221. Um, and uh, you see here some details on the benchmark. If you're interested to reproduce this, um, I can tell you exactly how. Um, uh, these are fresher results from um, kind of the next generation vector engine, VE10BE, but it's not the latest generation. And uh, except for um, logistic regression, um, we um, run with Spark version 3.0. So uh, Spark version 3.0 changed the API or actually removed the API of the logistic regression here. So we could not run it there in the same way. Um, and what you see is uh, strange enough we got better yeah, uh, compared to, to before or the Xeon got worse uh, I'm not sure maybe Spark got a little worse so we look actually better on this if you compare against two sockets you have uh, you still see that one vector engine is a pretty good machine for this kind of operations for this, this kind of uh, work and then there is a performance evaluation for data frame. Data frame, I now include only the results with the VE10BE. So with the uh, middle skew of our vector engine, 
uh, with a memory band with a 1.35 terabytes per second. Um, evaluation is um, with TPCH, SF20. These are classical database benchmarks. So um, first case is um, um, group by aggregate. Uh, then uh, you see filter or join group by aggregate. This is a chain of operations, another chain of operations and another chain of operation. So all this should actually convey to you is um, for data preparation, data processing, um, if you have big data, um, you might give uh, Aurora a try because it, it, it brings real benefit. And this can be actually something that you want to do in your AI pipeline or for repairing data for your training. Uh, here are some pointers and resources, which uh, means that I'm close to the end of the talk. Um, uh, I mentioned the repository, it's on GitHub. Uh, look at the README MD, it explains you how to install. Check out the releases section of the repository. There you will find the latest release. It's released as an RPM. But you can, I think you can also install with, with PyPy, with pip. Um, you will have to use pip to to create your uh, environment properly uh, then uh, start with tutorials for python or spark that's the simplest way to start uh, getting used to this system and when you're done with that then you have the manuals to really look for details of every api and all the details and uh, finally this is a link Link to performance uh, benchmark and tips to improve performance. Um, yeah, basically, I would like to keep it here. Thank you very much um, for your attention. And I don't know what I need to do to pass over now. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, that's not the case. So let's switch back to. Uh, There's the question. So the question is if I understand you well, you would not recommend Vector Engine for media. What do you mean? Uh, how about analyzing images in terms of recognizing objects, making statistics of others? I don't remember to have said that. If I said that, then it was a miss. Um, yeah. Uh, so wh what I... If the question is for me, yeah, um, basically, once you want to analyze data, let's say, if, if you if you want to find commonalities in your or clustering in your data or something like this, then Providis is your way. Uh, that that's something very fast, much faster than than what you have with uh, Spark with the other statistic machine learning things. Uh, if you are going after uh, graphics, pictures, um, um, uh, and so on, then I need to pass over to Nicolas Weber. Um, the core of all those algorithms are CNNs, convolutional neural networks. Uh, for inference, um, vector engine is is okay-ish, is good. If you use inference inside your HPC program and you're mixing HPC with with um, uh, AI, then the vector engine is a very good platform because it can do both things well. Uh, I mean, HPC, it can do very well, and inference, it can also do very well. Uh, yeah, inference on batch size one, so to say. Um, is there an integration with existing ML libraries like sklearn, TensorFlow, PyTorch to the below vector engine API? Um, okay, so scikit-learn, 
is the so Frovedis has an integration with scikit-learn, yes, and TensorFlow PyTorch is the realm of Sol, uh, which I'm actually uh, eager to pass back to Nicholas because uh, this, you know, uh, Frovedis is kind of complementing Sol in preparing the data for Sol, so to say, if you do machine learning tasks, it's not replacing it. Yeah, it has no, these are completely different things. It's the pure statistical machine learning and uh, what you usually call deep learning AI. Yeah. Sol is optimizing deep learning AI while Frovedis is for big data processing. So in preparation for, for machine learning AI. So yes, there is integration in Frovedis for scikit-learn and TensorFlow PyTorch is covered by Sol. Uh, probably uh, th that's an answer for me. Uh, yes, there is. So um, actually there's two ways. So you can even, for instance, take PyTorch, load the model and then use PyTorch plus Sol to run it on the vector engine. Um, or in the new release, which Unfortunately, it's not out there yet. Yet um, you will have the option to directly load and own an X model and um, compile it into an external uh, library. So the sole deploy that I pre um, presented before is available for own and X directly without any framework support. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? If not then I would uh, continue with the uh, hands-on part. Okay, I think there's no further question. Okay, good. Um, the uh, the hands-on parts uh, is a little bit structured about different uh, parts actually um, that I want to present. Uh, I start with uh, how to install Sol and um, to ask Eric, he pretended that it was a pain for a long, long time. So we, um, but we now have a very, very simple um, way. You only need to install a, a pip package. So you use pip install um, and the Python wheel file, and that's it. There will be a change in the upcoming version because Sol supports more and more uh, different kinds of frameworks, and in the future you will need to um, add uh, dependencies. Um, at the end, if you want to install it for specific frameworks. For instance, if you're working with PyTorch, you don't want to have Sol to install also TensorFlow and ONNX and stuff. So you actually can select during the installation process uh, what you want to have. Um, one more slide on the um, yeah uh, terminology. So uh, Sol vocabulary is, is nearly identical to normal vocabulary, like layers, a layer, tensor is a tensor, a model is a model. Um, fused layers, we um, uh, I use the term cluster, so because we cluster them together and then we fuse them. Uh, for a framework, we use the term front end. For the device, it's device, and compute library compiler is back end. Um, so we have a distinction between back end device and back end library. So it's, um, that's actually the reason for it. Um, okay. To use Sol, you actually need to import the package. In this case, it's just import sol.pytorch as Sol. And um, then it already shows you like this uh, disclaimer screen, which uh, has some information like uh, log level of information, time and seconds and start. This is a little bit more uh, debugging information, like which component the message comes from and source location. So in case you run into any troubles, this is very helpful for us to pinpoint where the error is coming from. Um, it further shows you like the version you are using and the release name. For release name, we actually decided to use the names of solar systems. Uh, existing one, the, the version that we will use today is um, the first one is um, Altair and the second one will be to choose. And some as a disclaimer, you can ignore it. Um, then we have a call, um, function call which is called Soul Devices, which um, sh um, shows you like a device dump of all devices that Soul has detected where it can run on. Um, might be helpful for debugging. Um, it, 
in the system that you're using, it should look a little bit like this. So probably have a different uh, Xeon server, but it should be the same um, um, Aurora device. Um, once you have used the device, um, it will be turned on. So it showed as an activated device uh, in the green. And then it also shows you a used memory consumption. Um, that is precise for the Aurora. It's very unprecise for other devices like the CPU. So I, you should not um, directly rely on this. Um, so it's still in uh, development, let's put it this way. And um, then we have this star up front here, which indicates the default device. So for instance, in PyTorch, if you just say, um, copy this to um, to the Aurora and don't device um, specify a specific um, number, for the device, then always the device zero will be used. However, in PyTorch, there's a method to define that, for instance, the default device is one or two. So this is just indicating which one will be selected if you don't provide uh, a specific number for the device. Um, then we have a, a sole versions uh, function call, which shows you like a version dump of all of the libraries and compilers that we're using. It's also mostly a for debugging, but it also helps, for instance, if you see um, here we have the NCC, uh, NCC compiler version 3028. Um, it could be that uh, Sol detects uh, the wrong version that you're not wanting to use. Um, so this can be helpful in debugging sometimes. Or for instance, if you see that the GCC version is very old, that could also be problematic. I think everything past four point something should work, but yeah it can be a reason for problem. Or if you're using a different version of a PyTorch, Python or whatever. Um, okay, now for the more interesting part. Um, for machine learning, seeds are very important. And Sol comes with its own seeding system for the random number generators. Uh, uh, similar to other frameworks, we use three different types of seeds. We have Clipple, which is um, for all devices, a device type, which is specific for a specific device can say, I want to have seed uh, for the CPUs and I want to have a seed for uh, the Auroras and then for a specific device itself. And for this, you just have like this function where you can get and set a seed, uh, where you define the device type and the device index. Um, if both is none, then it's the global. If it's only one type and none for the device, it's for the device type and so on. And um, you also can use the command soul seeds to get an overview of uh, which are the seeds currently um, used by Sol. So in this case, the global one is the first line. We always show in a hex number and a, a decimal number. Um, and for the CPUs, it's this one. And for this particular CPU, it's zero, zero in this case. And for the egg vector engine, it's the same as the global ones. Um, yeah, one more um, stuff. Um, uh, we also um, uh, use uh, for initializing this value the current timestamp. So um, every time you run your script, you either need to set it manually or it will be randomized. Good. For debugging, we actually have a couple of um, uh, features in there. They were originally only for development, but I think they could also be helpful for uh, writing your own neural networks uh, because we have also a visualization of the neural network. And so this might be helpful. So the first thing is we have a command a soul config where you can set different uh, values. And the first one is compiler name, which is used as a prefix for all of the debug output because we are generating files. And then you can just say, okay, I want to have my files called my network. And all of the files will start with my network and then some uh, postfix. Um, this might be helpful if you want to run your script with multiple networks, for instance, different versions and we have um, different output for all of these. Um, uh, we generate C, C++ code for all of devices and they are generated into a uh, folder, which is .sol, then the device name and source. Um, so we don't want to hide what we are doing from you. So if you're really interested, you can take a look on it. It might not be obvious to read the code because it's machine generated um, and, the file and the variable names are just uh, T and then some numbers. So it might be a little bit difficult, but actually the numbers match with the ones that you have in the visual output. So which I'll show on the next slide. Um, because if you use sole config compiler debug and set us to true, uh, first what's happened, it compiles everything with debug symbols. So we actually can use uh, GDB 
uh, to even um, jump through all of the uh, generated code from Sol. Um, it prints the execution times of the fuse layers, which looks like this. So uh, you actually get an output where um, this shows like the device name. This is a hash number of the neural network that we have. Um, this is the method that we use to implement it. So in this case, um, I'm sorry for the background noise. Unfortunately, there are some work down here today. Um, yeah, the next one is um, the backend that we're using. In this case, this one is implemented with the VEDNN library. Then NCC is usually our code generator, which is generating um, our own code and then compiled with NCC. Um, they have like the pass. In this case, it's a forward inference pass um, because you know uh, for new network training you have different passes: uh, the forward pass and the backward pass usually in training, and then you also have the forward pass in uh, inference, which can be different. Um, so you actually don't need to do all of the computations uh, in the inference pass, which you would need to do in the in training pass. And yeah, finally you you get some. Uh, microseconds in the end here so in this case you would see that this is actually the, the most time consuming part and then you could go into folder and look up the file which you can see has like a similar naming convention and then you can see um, can you actually grab the file and take a look at the code and say okay guys this is very slow you need to remove this um, another thing it's it's outputting um, a visualization of the neural network in this dot soul debug folder which looks like this so um, I have to admit, in the next version, it would look a little bit different um, because we uh, improved some parts. And uh, but it generally shows you like the layer plus the output tensor. So um, in neural networks, a layer sometimes has multiple outputs. So that's why we have uh, separated this. For instance, uh, a threshold in training has two outputs, where the first one is like the data stream. That's like the, the violet ones here, and the second one is uh, a, t a temporary data which is stored for uh, the backward pass and uh, yeah and what you also can see is usually um, the size so this one is a, a, a one batch a batch size of one 64 uh, channels and two pixel sizes uh, that you also can identify with the um, thing up here and this one is just uh, the strides of the data if you are interested into the details um, another thing is that you can set uh, the compiler debug memory consumption. That's actually something new that came in, I think, 2.7 or something. And um, it actually shows you a statistic report of the memory consumption of your neural network. And um, we distinguish actually three kinds of different data, uh, blue, red, and green. Blue one is uh, input data, like inputs and parameters. They are fully managed by the framework. So, um, so it's just using this. And so there is no option that Sol could anywhere, uh, um, anyhow, uh, improve the memory consumption on this, actually coming from the outside. Um, then we have the red ones, which are outputs, like output or gradients. Gradients are the output for the backward pass. And um, they are also managed by uh, the framework. It can be that we can allocate them after the execution, but usually, for instance, TensorFlow, TensorFlow pre-allocates all of this memory up front, so we cannot uh, postpone it. And the green ones are actually the memory used by Sol, usually for temporary results to passing data from one layer to another, and um, or intermediate data. So some some of the operations, uh, for instance, if you use them with the compute libraries like um, DNNL, VE, DNN, and so on. Um, they require temporary scratch pad uh, memory, and this is also counted into this. Um, yeah, and every step actually here, so you see a, re a weird random number down here. Um, those are actually uh, diffused layers of us. So each of these steps is calling like a different, because those are the diffused layers that we have. Uh, one reminder, this requires uh, the matplotlib in installed, with, um, otherwise it will fail. And the last step actually for debugging is uh, you can activate the tracing. So there are two ways. You either can set this as a config value again, or just use the environmental variable uh, soul log with the value trace. Um, but I have to warn you. You so this is very very verbose and will generates hundreds of megabytes in an hour or something. So it's um, only if you're really interested in what's happening underneath. Um, okay, any questions for the, uh, the the basics before I continue with the integration into PyTorch?
Uh, doesn't seem the case. Okay. So um, the problem with PyTorch is that PyTorch does not come with support for storing data on the uh, Aurora. Um, so we added this support to Sol and we implemented in a way that you don't need to recompile PyTorch at all. So you just use your normal PyTorch package and we load a different library and integrate it into the um, loaded uh, PyTorch, which adds all of the functionality which has the side effect, unfortunately, that we need to use the HIP device, which is usually meant for AMD, um, as we cannot add new device types to PyTorch without recompiling. So, um, but if you're interested on, um, on how we did this, so we have a paper out there and, and you also find the paper on our homepage on the link that I sent previously in the, in the chat messages. So, um, well, Given this, actually the usage is uh, very similar to if you use with CUDA, just you replace everything with HIP. So if you want to copy data to the Aurora, you just use your CPU tensor to HIP. And uh, the same way also for uh, copying data back to the CPU, you just put dot .CPU or to .CPU to the end. Um, if you want to copy the model, it's the same to HIP. Unfortunately, we cannot use the dot .HIP. I'm not sure why. Um, I tried to figure it out but that seems not to be really implemented if you don't have like the native support built into the PyTorch. However, the two method always works. Um, we further have uh, the torch hip synchronize method to wait for all of the computations to be done. Um, on top of that, we actually, um, you might, if you've been working with CUDA, you might know the CUDA visible devices uh, environmental variable where you can limit um, the devices that can be used by uh, the framework. And we also have this with VIDA visible devices. And then you just put in the um, numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, in the clustering system that you're using, if you have like the scheduling system, it will probably set uh, the environmental VE node number. And then you need to uh, put it uh, in, in the VIDA visible devices. So Sol is actually taking over the value of the VE node number. Okay, there are unfortunately some issues. So, um, 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 as I said before, uh, I had like a free line um, bug fix for PyTorch, and this is actually one of the bug fixes that I have. So, because when we load Sol with the Aurora support into PyTorch, it has a negative impact on the Core Torch Concat operation if you run it on the CPU. It sounds hilarious, but unfortunately, it is the case. Um, so I submitted a bug fix. It's already in the version 1.6. Unfortunately, the version of Sol that we're using today is for 1.51. So the bug fix is not in there, but it will be in the next release. Um, further, um, I only implemented like a minimalistic um, function support for uh, uh, all of the functionalities of PyTorch that you use outside of your model. So inside your model, you can use actually a lot of um, stuff, but not outside of the model, um, because this would uh, re require um, a tight, tighter integration into PyTorch and actually try to avoid this. And um, so something like tensor A plus B minus multiplication module and something like this is all implemented, also print, um, but uh, not like the neural networks layers. They are only implemented if you use them inside your model and apply the model to the Sol optimum. Um, so whenever you get a message like function X is not implemented for hip tensor ID, you run into like one of the problems. Um, one of the workarounds that you could use is to copy the data to the CPU that copy back to the Aurora. It's uh, not a nice solution, but uh, you usually, I can show you later, you usually hardly run into these problems. And another problem is actually, where I also have no idea, if you use the print tensor and the tensor is located on the Aurora, it will always show the results in scientific notation and have no idea why there's no option to set this behavior. Not, not from inside, not from outside. So it's totally, so very weird. Um, okay, so you probably complained that you finally want to use it and so I'm hurrying up. Um, New networks, uh, can, or actually PyTorch, has four different ways of executing a model. So then use the NoCrad and the model eval. You can use NoCrad with the training and you cannot use NoCrad and so on. However, Sol 
does only support two versions of this. So Soul supports inference, uh, which is identical to NoCrad and Model Eval, and training, which is um, identical to not using NoCrad and Model Training. So whenever you use uh, one of the other options, Soul will just fall back to um, the other ones. And um, but it will show you an error message telling you like, oh, I'm using a different behavior. So in case you are warned. Um, good. Now to the point where we want to optimize our model. Um, for this, as I said before, we use the Soul Optimize uh, method with some parameters and explaining them now. So the first one is the model. This can be anything which extends like Torch and then Module, which is any predefined model. You can write your own models. You can use the um, and then sequential and so on. So literally everything that you usually run as a neural not network model in PyTorch, you can pass it in there. Um, after this, you can have multiple inputs and inputs can be either uh, a torch tensor object, um, any primitive data type, could be even strings, uh, floating numbers. So uh, Sol will ignore these inputs, but uh, usually you have, um, it could be that you have them in there to set some runtime parameters or something. Um, then we also have like a sole input um, struct where you can put define an input size of uh, the input. Vector. You can define if it requires a gradient and a data type, which is usually in a PyTorch format. Uh, reason for this sole input is that uh, you might want to have a, vari a variable um, batch size. Um, so when you use the torch tensor, we read the size of um, the, the input that you're putting there and we generate the code explicitly for the size that you have there. That's because of performance reasons. And um, yeah, if you use the sole input, you can define the very first dimension as zero, which is the wild card, which means that for running, you can do arbitrary batch sizes. However, if you use this, you need to set the third parameter, um, which is a batch size, because Sol internally is using some heuristics and sometimes also auto-tuning. And um, it's important that Sol, uh, I mean, there's a big difference between optimizing a neural network for batch size one and for batch size 128. So uh, this should be in the range that for the model where you want to run it. There is hardly any difference, for instance, for 130 and 128. Hardly makes any difference. But these extremes with one and something bigger, this is this is actually very important to use here. Um, okay, now coming to to a very simple example, uh, we're importing the packages. Uh, we're defining a very simple model, which is actually doing A plus B. Not very nice, but however, that should work. We initialize the model then we can set some config parameters if we want to. They need always to be defined before the optimized call, otherwise they will not be recognized. Um, then you, we do our sole optimized call. In this case, uh, we have two inputs with the size uh, with a variable batch size and the second dimension is 50. And um, we want to optimize the model for the batch size 32. Um, the next step is if you want uh, to use the same parameters as your, as your pipe, um, PyTorch model, you explicitly need to copy um, the state dictionary into the Sol model. Um, okay, in this case, you actually don't need it because this doesn't have any parameters, but if you had layers in there like convolutions, which had um, parameters, then you would need to do this if you want to have like the same starting point. Otherwise, the, the parameters will be initialized randomly. And then you copy the model to the Aurora. And then we actually can go on to the execution. So in this case, I'm generating some random data with batch size five. Um, I'm copying it to the Aurora and I'm setting the, the model to the eval mode, running it into the NoCrad. And then I just run the data, get some output and print the results. And uh, you could also run um, the, the Pi model with the same data and then compare the results in the end. And they should be nearly identical. So there is always chance that uh, there's some numerical difference, but that should be rather small actually. And for training, it's a little bit more complicated as you probably know. So you first set the model in training mode, then you might have like an epoch uh, for loop. Then you usually have like a training loader, which provides you all of the data that you want to train on. And um, 
that's usually provided on the CPU. So we first need to compute, uh, copy it onto the Aurora, then we run the forward pass, get some result. And this now comes to the point where it's getting a little bit tricky. So as I said, um, hardly any functionality is implemented outside of this sole model. So to, to compute the loss, we copy the data actually back to the CPU, run the loss function on the CPU, and then we just call the backward function. And what happens is um, the backward function will call the loss function on the CPU, then copy the, everything back to the Aurora, and then run it through the entire model running on the Aurora. So this is the current way to do it. Uh, we are evaluating if we can improve this without uh, too much effort to uh, implement all of the functionality with PyTorch. And of course, if you want to do it in the end, you can uh, synchronize all of your computations. Um, known issues and pitfalls, actually, um, I see on, on the audience list, uh, we have Thomas, which is one of our guinea pigs, uh, which, which I'm very happy of to have. So he's uh, sometimes running into problems I have never seen before, which is helping us to debug all of the um, application. So um, one of the errors you sometimes can run into is something like SQLite error, unique constraint, failed, whatever, uh, which means that SOL usually crashed before in the compilation step and that SOL cache is corrupted. There are two easy ways to um, solve it. So either you can remove the entire .sol folder and a second way is to put a SOL cache clear before the SOL optimize. Um, yeah, the reason behind this is that we don't want to recompile everything again, again, again. So we have like a caching mechanism in there. And um, if that gets corrupted, then unfortunately, uh, this needs to be done. Um, another thing that we actually figured out, the version that you're still using is if you uh, have your model, which is compiled for the SX Aurora, and you put in the data on the wrong device, Sol is not complaining and you get a sec fault. This is fixed in the next version. And also we um, found that there are some problems with the deploy function and in, in the version that you're using. Uh, it still can be used, but requires some manual fixing in a generated code, but will also be entirely fixed in an upcoming version. Okay, um, I'm nearly at the end. So um, this one, I'm, I'm changing my window. So this is the uh, sole document that we want to also provide you. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, it, I think it could be improved a little bit, but it should contain all of the information that you need. So first of all, it, on, the, on the starting page, you have like all of the, the releases that we had so far with the changes and uh, bug fixes and so on. Um, under usage, you will find um, most of the functionality that are already presented, like this little config, config print, optimize, deploy, but also some uh, a, a more advanced functionality for instance we also have like a profiler integrated uh, which i don't want to show here which can print you some numbers or versions devices seed and so on um for debugging as i said before we have the um, different uh, flags here which generate these graphs and uh, um, the memory consumption with some explanation we have of course a little bit more config options that I presented here. Most of them are for debugging purposes. Um, some of them are already deprecated. And um, yeah, if you want to have a closer look, you can take a look at these and uh, try out. Um, some of them also not really change something. For instance, if you uh, change something with these cat fusion, usually the performance doesn't really suffer under it. Okay, for the frameworks. So we try to um, have the same experience for all of the frameworks that you're optimizing. So it always will have something like a sole optimize function with the model inputs and so on. Um, then there are specifications for um, specific um, frameworks in this case for PyTorch. Um, also again, with, with a little bit more uh, detailed, uh, yeah, how's it called? Uh, example, um, a list of all networks we have trained and this is actually the supported layers. This is probably um, important. This is all of the functions that you can use in your neural network that we have implemented so far. And the list is very long, so I will not go through it. So if you're interested, you can really can take a look on it. Um, deployment, as I said before, this is the this, um, sole deploy functionality uh, with some ex um, more details. 
and uh, um, yeah, some additional functionality. So for instance, for some devices, it could be that, um, where's it down here, you need to define like an ar architecture string to uh, as parameters for M arch, M tune, because when you deploy this different hardware architecture, um, it could be uh, that you need to set them correctly. For instance, if you put this onto a native and your CPU supports AVX 512 and you copy the application to a server with only AVX 2, it will just tell you illegal instruction and will die. Um, but you don't need to do this for the SX over, as you can see, not needed. Um, for devices, we also have some information. This is what I showed before with the how to copy data, what are the um, functions that are implemented. Unfortunately, as I said before, we cannot use the dot .hip because it's somehow not working. And here's some explanation for common problems that we had encountered so far. I think the biggest problem so far is that people didn't use the VDA visible devices. And when two users have been using the same server, um, one of the application just told, yeah, I cannot start the um, SX Aurora because somebody else is using it. So, And last, um, part of the documentation actually is uh, a method. So in case you encounter a layer that we haven't implemented yet, um, you can in, uh, implement it uh, as follows. So that you have, that you split your model into multiple parts and um, you run the first part with soul, the second one you just use as, as is, and um, the third part again with soul. And then you can have like a, a macro model outside, uh, which is just calling A, B, C. And then first part is executed with soul, the second one with the framework, usually on CPU, and the third one again with soul.